Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you just had to be there. It's the last time someone said that to you. You had to be there. It's not usually the sort of thing we like hearing someone say, whether you're standing on the outside of an inside joke, or you, there was some incredible event that happened and you happened to miss out on it. You're not in the know. A group of friends get together and just have a wonderful time and you are missing from that group. Ah, wish you were there. You missed out. I think there are a lot of events in scripture that seem like you had to be there types of moments. You ever got these where you go through Bible history and you see any of these events? And I can't imagine what that was like. Standing on the shores of the Red Sea as that sea was split in two. And a whole nation climbs down into a, a sea basin to cross on dry ground. What must that have been like? To witness some of the miracles that Jesus had done. To see some of the most momentous events in all of human history take place. Or you maybe get the sense that the vision that Isaiah saw could have been one of those. What well, you had to be there types of moments. I struggle to imagine what that looked like for Isaiah. He gives a description probably as best he can, but even here, even from inspired scripture, it seems like human language fails to capture what his eyes beheld. What did it look like to see the Almighty God seated on his throne, high and exalted? Help me understand the description of how the, the skirt of his robe fills the entire temple. To gaze upon the face of the Lord. Those seraphim, those powerful, mighty angels with the six wings, what did they look like? They have a burning, fiery appearance. Uh, they covered their faces, covered their feet, and flying, standing ready at the Lord's command to serve him. And the song, my goodness, how many different versions of, of the Sanctus, the holy, 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 do we know and have we sung? How did that song originally go? What does it sound like from, from the antiphonal singing of the angels such that it, it must have been so majestic and beautiful and glorious and, and, and shaking the, the rafters and the foundations of the temple in which they were? Amazement, incredible. What must that have been like if only we were there? Then again, maybe not. That's not exactly how the prophet Isaiah saw things, was it? Good thing I'm here. That was the last thing on his mind. For all the things that he was beholding in this vision... For all the amazing, incredible things that he saw, the last thing on his mind was the wonder and amazement of it, though I'm sure he was filled with awe and amazement. It wasn't joy and excitement, thrill that were on his mind, though. It was distress and anguish and horror that was on Isaiah's mind. Coming into the presence of the Lord in his holy temple, gazing on the face of God, and he becomes fully aware of his own sin, his own shortcomings, his own uncleanness. It's no wonder why he reacts the way he does when he says, I am ruined, I am doomed, I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. It really brings into focus for us this concept of holiness. What does it mean really to be holy? We often associate this word with the concept of perfection, righteousness, to be without sin. 
in behavior mostly, right? And that's not necessarily wrong, but the, the base root meaning of the word holy really means set apart. Entirely other, outside of this entire other ordinary group and category of people or things either can be holy and set apart for a special purpose. For example, you, you take the communion where I'm sure somewhere around is a, a chalice, a common cup communion. It is sacred, it is holy, it is set apart for a special purpose, which is delivering the very blood of Jesus to the lips of the communicant and holding it, uh, it within it. That is its express holy purpose set apart for that reason. And so there, therefore, it would be entirely inappropriate uh, for a pastor to use the chalice to drink his morning coffee out of for a plain, ordinary purpose like that. It, it's not what it's for. Nor would just any mug, ceramic or otherwise, be necessarily appropriate for the sacred purpose of, of serving, delivering the Lord's Supper, right? We have sacred vessels that are set apart for that special reason. In the ancient Near East, they had a good, solid concept of what was sacred, what was holy, and what was not. Even among pagan nations in their false worship, they had things that were sacred. They had people that were holy. Even though the purposes and functions of those things in idol worship were not holy at all, by as we would think of them, you might have had priests who, who worshipped before these false gods and deities and performed their rituals and sacrifices, and they were set apart, and they were a class unto themselves. You didn't mess with them, and they were recognized as special people. You maybe had temple prostitutes with some of the horrible religions going around, and they were set apart, and you didn't touch them, but they were set aside for, for those um, unholy purposes in, in some of the horrible types of worship and, and so forth. But it was only within Israel where to be holy was not just set apart, but it was set apart according to God's righteousness and holiness. The Lord had chosen Israel out of all the nations of the earth, and he said, you, Israel, you are my chosen people. You are my treasured possession. I am calling you out of the nations to be separate and apart from them all. And one of the main ways in which they would be a people holy to the Lord and set apart would be through following the Lord's law, holding and keeping his covenant, his statutes that he had laid out before them. And in that, we kind of come to attribute holiness with that ethical sense, with keeping the law. And that's why we associate it so closely, because that's, that's a lot of what it meant for the people of Israel. And, and we, we touch on this in the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, don't we? Hallowed be your name. Holy be your name, Lord. What does that mean? Well, God's name is already holy all by itself without our trying. But we pray that we would keep it holy and the Lord would help us to do that. Well, how do we do that? Luther says, well, we keep God's name holy by teaching rightly according to his word and living holy lives according to it. Help us to do this, dear Lord. But we profane the name of God when we go against it, when we live contrary to God's word and we, we teach wrongly according to it. Keep us from doing this, dear Lord. And so in that sense, in an ethical sense of holiness, abiding by God's laws and commands, we, we kind of recognize that to be holy is, is kind of an absolute, right? You're either holy or you're not. How do you have degrees of holiness? You don't have less holy or more holy or holier than thou. You are either holy or you are not at all. And yet you get a different sense in this vision, don't you? Even these holy, perfect angels, and every one of them was without sin, even they feel necessary to hide their faces in the presence of God and to cover their feet when they stand before his glorious face. And they are the ones who are singing to one another, holy, 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 three times holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I'm fully convinced that this is Trinitarian, the three times holy, that he is the, the holy God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But we'll wait till this shows up on a Trinity Sunday to focus more on that. For our purposes, this three times holy in Hebrew is a superlative. Holy, holier, holiest. 
is the Lord of hosts, even so set apart far above even these holy angels. The Lord is entirely other, but in a different category, all unto himself. It's no wonder then that Isaiah said, I'm doomed, I'm ruined. When the very presence of him polluted the presence of the Lord. It, it, just as if a, a bride would get all dressed up and ready to go with her wedding gown on on her wedding day and would go around and splash around in the mud. The very presence of a sinner before the face of the Lord pollutes his presence, makes it filthy. He cannot survive. He cannot stand in his presence. Peter had the same reaction. As soon as he got a whiff of Jesus' divine power with that miraculous catch of fish, that's a once-in-a-lifetime sort of thing if you're into fishing. It, so many fish that you catch that it's tearing your nets and starting to sink your boats. And yet it wasn't thrill and exhilaration that was filling Peter, was it? It was despair and horror. It wasn't the sort of exhilaration when you got that 16-point buck sized up, that mythical beast, and you're like... Finally could have took it down. No dread and horror. Get away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And for Isaiah, for Simon Peter, these are men who would be called into the public ministry. We recognize that there are qualifications the Lord has for the public ministry that in human standards, you need to be righteous and upright and above reproach. Not perfect, certainly, and none of them were. But there is a standard of obedience and righteousness the Lord expects. And Isaiah was going to be one of, one of the most prolific and significant of all the writing prophets. Maybe second only to Moses. Peter was going to be the leader among the apostles of the Lord, a pillar of the church. And if these men are despairing in the presence of the Lord and saying, I'm not worthy, I'm, I'm undone, I'm doomed, I'm ruined. Where in the world would that leave you and me? Dear friends, you are, of a, you are a congregation well over 100 years old with a, a storied history to it, holding to the gospel in word and sacraments, keepers of the mysteries of God, and this by God's grace alone. And yet how easy can it be to think that worth in having the mysteries of God and the means of grace is something that comes by longevity of a congregation that you hold by virtue of some sort of family pedigree and fourth generation Christian faith, something that is some worth and value you have of your own as though your feeble hands are ones to rightly hold the holy mysteries and gospel of our Lord Jesus. This is not something we are fit it's not something we are worthy of by ourselves. It's not something that we even work towards and make ourselves worthy and kind of cleanse and purify ourselves to be purveyors of this, to be the church of God, and to bring this gospel not only to one another, but, but to a whole community that surrounds us. Unclean. Unclean we are. It's very interesting how the ancient church chose to use this song of the seraphim for well over a thousand years they have always attached this song and they named it by the latin name the sanctus the word for holy they've attached it to the communion liturgy and i think they've wisely done that you know why because they recognize what happens in the lord's supper and they recognize something about the throne room of god did you notice where Isaiah is here? Nowhere does it say he's whisked away into the, the throne room of the Lord and to the, the third heaven or anything like that. He writes, I was in the temple. These things, the, the smoke filled the temple, it says. And so we probably mostly associate this with the temple in Jerusalem. And if the whole earth is full of God's glory, that means the throne of God is not simply situated on the highest heaven, but the throne of God fills heaven and earth. And God sits enthroned exactly where he pleases to be enthroned. 
The church for hundreds of years has recognized, you know the place where God desires to be enthroned among us is? It's nowhere else than upon the altar when you celebrate the Lord's Supper. Jesus Christ is enthroned there with his very real substantial body and his true blood in, with, and under bread and wine. That is Jesus who is brought right before your presence. And though you may not see it, though you may not perceive it with your ears and with your eyes, you do indeed join their holy and glorious song with seraphim in the presence of God enthroned upon the altar. How much thought do we really give to that? And to enter into the presence of the Lord, you're not whisked up into the third heaven as John Kelvin thought somehow spiritually to partake of this in a spiritual sense, as though you and I can be in two places at once, but Jesus can't. No, he brings the throne room down here, right in your midst. And when we present ourselves before the Lord, unclean lips, how can we suppose that we can speak ill of one another? That we can harbor grudges? That we can lobby for our positions and have our own pet things that we hold on to and speak ill and backstab one another and further spite and envy and rivalry among our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's not somehow going to pollute the presence of the Lord and everything's just going to be okay when we come into his presence. Unclean lips. And they're brought forth from an unclean heart, from the inside out. Isaiah felt it keenly. Peter got it. You and I, Stand right alongside them in doom and dread. But then something amazing happens. Without Isaiah begging or pleading, without bargaining and saying, well, if only I do this, I'll do this, Lord. Without any of that, the Lord steps into action through the ministry of his angel, one of the seraphim, who takes a burning live coal from the altar with a pair of tongs. And he brings it over to Isaiah and he touches it upon his lips. What must have that felt like? Isaiah doesn't go into a burning live coal. And he says, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is atoned for. Your sins are forgiven. Isaiah recognized what that burning hot coal did to his iniquity and his sin. He recognized the altar of burnt offering as the place where atonement is made. Atonement, an important concept of the Old Testament. And we talk about the atoning sacrifice that Christ is. This is really the sacrifice that, that, that makes satisfaction, that, that brings to fulfillment the, the punishment and the wrath of God against sin. The wages of sin is death. That's just the, the nature of God's holiness and righteousness and yet atonement speaks of one who is brought in place, an innocent victim who suffers that punishment, who is delivered unto death in place of the sinner. And that victim sheds its blood. He's burned up upon the altar. And atonement is made and sin is covered over. Isaiah recognized that altar of burnt offering. This is the place where atonement is made where the sins are covered over, where my sin and guilt are taken up, lifted up, and removed. As the psalmist says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And it's by what happens on that altar that purifies my lips. And yes, and purified Isaiah from the inside out entirely, making him fit for service only by the work of Christ. Isaiah understand who that was seated on the throne that was none other than the Lord Jesus himself the evangelist John writes in his epistle when he's talking about uh, the words of Isaiah in chapter 12 he says Isaiah saw Jesus glory and wrote about him that was Christ himself 
enthroned on the altar, the only Son of God, eternally gotten of the Father. And he knew Isaiah's sins quite keenly. He understood them. But it wasn't because of the offering of a burnt lamb or goat or bull upon that altar that Isaiah's sins were removed and atoned for. The Lord Jesus knew well what was the atoning sacrifice. Isaiah and the Old Testament believers understood this in the terms of lambs and goats and bulls and the atonement on the altar. But the Lord Jesus saw ahead to that one great day where atonement would be made once and for all. Not an altar of burnt offering, but the altar of a wooden cross outside Jerusalem, where not a lamb or a bull or a goat would be hung up, but the Son of God himself, shedding his holy, precious blood, giving his innocent suffering and death up to the Lord, his heavenly Father, to make atonement for Isaiah's sins and Simon Peter's sins and your sins once and for all. Faith looks at that altar at the cross and says, their atonement is made. There the blood of Jesus, the once and for all sacrifice is shed and there this blood has touched me and I lay hold of that by faith. Your sin is atoned for. As far as the east is from the west, your guilt is carried away and removed forever from the presence of God. We have a very real understanding of that this morning, don't we? Where the very price of your redemption is delivered into your hand and touches upon your lips too. Thankfully not a burning hot coal. But the blood of Jesus, his son, which purifies us from all sin, which you drink. The body of the Lord on which were laid the sin and iniquity of us all. And by his stripes we are healed, laid upon your lips. And the Lord Jesus says this, for the forgiveness of your sins. Cleansed, fed, purified, made a people holy for the Lord, set apart for his purposes. And that's who you are. Not by your own worth or merit. Not by pedigree or longevity. But by the atoning sacrifice of your Lord Jesus Christ. Because he has declared you to be so. And faith clings to that and believes it. That can't help but change you. It changes you. It makes you entirely something else. Here's the call of the Lord. Whom shall we send? Who will go for us? For the Lord deigns to do this ministry of proclaiming the gospel, not through angels who would do it so much better and more competently than us, through fallen human beings who have experienced grace and no forgiveness. He says, you, I have made you fit through the blood of Christ to send you out. How can we help but say, yes, here I am, Lord. Send me. Bring these mysteries of the gospel right in our midst. Let us proclaim them to each other. Let us share them in kind and in like as we are united as one body under one head, Lord Jesus. You've placed us into a community among a people of unclean lips who do not know the Lord. And yet we have the forgiveness of sins. We have the gospel of salvation. We have the remedy and the only atoning sacrifice that cleanses and purifies and brings salvation. And that understanding, friends, you're not missing out on anything. And you didn't have to see the very vision that Isaiah saw. The Lord's enthroned right before you and says, you are my people. And I am your God. You go and you be that. And cleansed and purified, we say, here are we, Lord. Send us. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus.